We're just excited to be in your presence today. And Lord, as we uh, come around the Word of God, we just ask God that you'd speak to us clearly. Heaven come, in Jesus' name, amen. Come on, let's uh, give Luke a hand. It's amazing. Amazing, amazing, amazing. Well, uh, if you are a teenager in the place, you do not want to miss what they are about to do out the place there. So teenagers, head on out there. It's going to be absolutely incredible, amazing. And uh, let's uh, let's uh, lean in right now. We're coming around the Word of God. We're going to uh, do a few exciting things in the place now. But uh, uh, you know, as you can see behind me, it's Christmas time. It's, uh, it's just everywhere. I mean, you just walk in. Uh, to uh, the uh, malls and uh, music's playing. Wherever you go, uh, malls are doing their thing, uh, playing the music. It's just one of those things that uh, we are just uh, out there to experience. And uh, uh, you go down the streets, uh, houses have got their things uh, that are going on there. Uh, leave that there because, uh, you know what, if it's a living room, then I, I better just do a little bit of this here. But you can take this though, and uh, but it's, it's all good. I'll just give this over here. Uh, but hey, uh, no matter what happens, wherever you go, uh, there is uh, some uh, carols, there's houses uh, decorated inside, uh, outside, and uh, it's just all exciting. Christmas, anyone, any Christmas lovers in the place here? Just got to have the place set up in a certain way. Uh, but what, you know, what is Christmas all about? Well, most of us that have showed up here today, you know what Christmas is all about. Uh, of course, it's about the birth of Jesus. Uh, he was the promised Messiah. Uh, that have been spoken about uh, 456 times in the Old Testament. A number of different people over 4,000 years that there was a Messiah that was going to show up at some particular point. Now today I'm not going to talk about Christmas Day. I'm not going to talk about that particular moment. What I'm going to do though is I am going to talk about the season that we're in leading up to that day. Uh, and there is a particular season because Christmas Day is a specific day Jesus is born. But what about from today up to the 24th? What is that day all about? And uh, because there is actually a season there. And so this is what we're calling this, the call of Christmas. Uh, it's, it's all about that. And I want to lean into it. I want to discover what that call is. What our call is in the season uh, to do in that space there. And so, God, we just ask that you'd speak to us, make it known, Father, the calling that each of us have, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, the Bible, uh, as you know, is made up of, of two parts. We've got Old Testament, New Testament. Uh, Old Testament, 39 books, starting Genesis, going through Revelation, events from uh, creation, going up to a guy by the name of Malachi. Malachi, uh, the last time he spoke was about 400 years before Jesus showed up on the scene. Uh, then you have the New Testament, the arrival of Jesus, and uh, it takes the story of Jesus right up until the book of Revelation. Now, the Old Testament, uh, now I said 4,000 years, it's actually more correctly around 3,600 years uh, it's made up of, uh, you know, I guess historical books, there's poetical books that are in there, uh, there's prophets, major prophets, minor prophets there, uh, but it finishes with Malachi. And the interesting thing to note is this, is that when Malachi finishes, God goes in silence. Now, now God uses men and women to, to, to deliver His Word. So Old Testament is, is written by a number of different men and women uh, that I guess write down uh, either their story or their revelation. Uh, it is put in written form. Uh, but you know what? From Malachi up to Jesus, 400 years of silence is taking place at that time. 400 years with God. It's a long time. It's a long time. Uh, it's longer than I've lived, longer than any of us in this room have lived. It's a long time for us to, I guess, go through that. Uh, and then we come to the New Testament and something happens. Something takes place with a, a guy by the name of Zechariah. Uh, the king of the time is Herod. Herod is in rule at this particular time. And uh, there's a man by the name of Zechariah. Uh, he's, he's married to Elizabeth. Uh, scripture says that they were righteous in God's sight. Uh, they're careful to obey all of God's commands. 
Uh, and one of the things about their lives, they were old and age, but the problem was that they'd never had children. It was important uh, to Jewish people. Uh, it's important to people today that I, I guess that when, when man falls in love with woman, they get married and you know what, you, you want a, a legacy, you want to have kids, it's just part of the DNA of who we are, what God created inside of us. And what, what happens is this, is that, uh, that the olden age, they've passed the age of even being able to have children, and uh, what happens is Zechariah, uh, as one of the, the priests of the time, he's on the duty. Now, every year, uh, a priest would go behind the, the curtain into the Holy of Holies, and it was a moment where others would stay outside, they would pray, they would believe God, and they would go and there'd be sacrifices that would take place in uh, that Holy of Holies. Well, uh, this is what happens. But before we play this, uh, just know this, that there's been silence for 400 years. No one has heard from God. No, it's, someone's waiting. There's been the promises, over 456 promises that the Messiah is going to show up. And uh, then this man by the name of Zachariah walks into the Holy of Holies, and this is what takes place. We dumbed Don't it out for be us. Don't afraid, Zechariah. God has heard your prayer. Your wife, Elizabeth, will give you a son, and you are to name him John. You will have great joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great in the eyes of the Lord. He must never touch wine or alcoholic drinks. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even before his birth. And he will turn many Israelites to the Lord their God. He will be a man with the spirit and power of Elijah. He will prepare the people for the coming of the Lord. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children. And he will cause those who are rebellious to accept the wisdom of the godly. So 3,600 3, years, God's speaking clearly. And then he goes silent for 400 years. And the first thing that happens is that God sends an angel by the name of Gabriel, turns up, tells him you're going to have a child. I mean, that's the last thing that they thought would ever happen. You're going to have a child. You're going to name him John. He's going to be the one uh, that makes way for the coming Messiah. Uh, then not long after that, we come to Luke chapter 1, verses 26. Gabriel turns up to a teenager called Mary, testifying about the coming Jesus. An angel appeared and told me that she is also having a baby. He said to me, do not be afraid, Mary. For you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. How can this happen? For I am a virgin. The Holy Spirit will come upon you. and The power of the Highest will overshadow you. Therefore also that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. So you have her fiancé, Joseph, who flips out when he hears, I mean, I can just imagine Mary showing up going, hey, I got some news, I'm pregnant. And he's thinking to himself, you are, you, you, you've obviously uh, gone and done something that you should not have done. And uh, she goes, no, 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 no. Uh, it, it, was, it was God that did it. Uh, I had, you know, someone else turn up last night and he's like, girl, you have lost it. Uh, and uh, you've gone crazy. Uh, if there was a psych ward, we would lock you up, but we're, they haven't invented psych wards yet. Uh, and so it was at that moment, he was like, I'm done with this thing. I'll just slip out the back. I'll honor you. But uh, you know what? We cannot uh, continue this. And then that night, this happened. How could you? It's true, Joseph. The angel told angel? me. Angel? Mary, you've shamed me. You've shamed my family. We're from the royal line of David, and you do this. Please, please believe me. I wouldn't lie to you. I want to believe you, but I, I can't. I can't marry you. It's over. No. Dear Lord, no.
Joseph, son of David. Do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. Her baby is from God. She will give birth to a son. You will give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. A virgin will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. God is with us. For 400 years, God is silent, and then He shows up. He sends the archangel Gabriel and uh, testifies to three different people that the promised Messiah is coming, that Jesus was going to show up and uh, things were going to shift. I want to just submit to you today that the Christmas season, I'm talking about from now up until the day of His birth, is a day where we, uh, like Jesus, is to testify that Jesus is coming. And that is why it is the call of Christmas. The call of Christmas is for each and every one of us to actually testify that Jesus is coming. Now, when I say that word testify, we could use uh, a number of other words that the Bible has used or over the years have added, like sharing the gospel, witnessing, evangelism. Uh, God wants every one of us to be a voice for Him. God wants us to speak up and testify. And uh, you know what? You might just say, well, I'm not going to do that. I'll leave it over to the angels to do that. Well, it's nice for you to say that. But the problem was, Jesus said this to us. He said, go into the world and preach the good news to all creation. Uh, Well, uh, if that's the case, Pastor, then I'll go on a missions trip. Why don't you start with your neighbors, right? It says in Acts chapter 1, verses 8, that you receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the outermost parts of the earth. And so if you really look at that, uh, before you get to the outermost parts of the earth, and by the way, it's a lot cheaper, start with your Jerusalem. We're talking about your backyard. We're talking about your neighbors, right? Uh, Make that happen there. Now, uh, we ask the question all the time, uh, well, why, why do people not evangelize? A number of different reasons, right? Let's have a look at this. Number one uh, is that it's, there, there's ignorance. Uh, there's ignorance. So if people don't realize, and you may not realize, that that is part of our job as His disciples, as His sons and daughters, to partner with Him, to, to speak up and testify about Jesus, right? Number two, uh, fear. And, and typically, fear is the biggest reason why people don't speak up uh, invite because they're afraid uh, to testify, afraid of people's reactions. Uh, y- now, people say, well, you know, what, what if I tell them about Jesus and they say no? Well, if they say no, they say no, right? Uh, so uh, l- l- let's just say it like this. Like, if someone was to invite me to, to dinner, for example, and by the way, yesterday I had two phone calls Two different people rang me up and said, hey, do you want to do dinner tonight? Two different plans, and both of those plans were kind of really exciting. One was going in this direction, one was going in that direction. But the problem was I'd already made plans with someone else. And so for both of them, it's like, man, I'd so love to hang with you. Uh, Can we make another date, right? Can we do this? Uh, But I've already got another plan, and although your plan probably sounds more exciting than my previous plan, I'm a man of my word, and I've already locked into that, so, so I'm sorry I have to say no to that. Well, because I said no to them, right, does that mean that it's no forever? Right, it's just a result, right? So, so when, when, when Debbie over there invited me out to go to that production and to go to that uh, incredible meal that you mentioned on the phone the other day, uh, sorry, Tina, let's get that right. Uh, so, you know, it, it's very easy. I do that all the time. I'm sorry. But uh, it's one of those things that what, ha- what happens is it's just like, oh, this sounds so exciting. I'd love to, but, but I'm sorry. I just can't, can't do it. It's just a result. It doesn't mean that uh, if I ever get invited again. So I just want to just say this, that if someone says no to coming church in 2020, it doesn't mean that, that in 2022 they're going to say no again, Right? Uh, just see it as a result, not as failure. Often what happens is we see it as failure, and so therefore, because they said no, everyone else is going to say no, uh, but it's just a result. That's what it is. Now, uh, what's going to help you out here is understanding 
that statistics are on your side. What are you talking about, Pastor? Let's have a look at this up on the screen here, right? The survey was done asking who celebrates Christmas, right? Interesting that 97% of Christians celebrate Christmas. I don't know what the other 3% are doing, uh, but uh, you would kind of expect that if you're one of his children, you would celebrate that, right? You hear what I'm saying? It's kind of like, uh, you know, being married, uh, when your wife or husband uh, has a birthday, you are going to celebrate, not because you have to, because you want to. You want to celebrate that person. That's what it's about. When one of your kids, uh, you know what, you're going to celebrate. So, you know, obviously 97% are going to do that. It's interesting that 89% of agnostics celebrate Christmas. Now, an agnostic is someone that believes in the existence of a greater power or God. Uh, you know, they don't know what that is. They don't know what that kind of power is, that presence is up there. Uh, they can't prove it or disprove it, and so they would call themselves an agnostic, right? Uh, 62% of other religions celebrate Christmas. It's, it's interesting. I, I love that, uh, that, uh, you know what, on Christmas Day, handing over presents and uh, do, doing all the Christmas festivity, uh, they, they serve something else, but, you know, they don't realize they're actually serving uh, and uh, worshiping Jesus on that particular day. Uh, but, and uh, it's interesting that 55% of uh, atheists celebrate Christmas. They love the holiday, they love the food, they, lo- they love all that sort of stuff. But, you know, the reality is if you're an atheist, if you're a true atheist, uh, it's probably better for you to say to your boss, I want to work on that day because I don't believe in this stuff. Uh, but you know what? Jesus is the reason for the season. Uh, so you can see this, that, you know what? Uh, that, that, that you've got a good opportunity of inviting someone to church when the statistics are on your side. Next week, we've got the unwrapping Christmas production that, that's going on here. Uh, so, you know what, we have this. Uh, so here's the thing is that, you know what, uh, let's have a look at some more statistics. Uh, another survey, uh, asking people reasons why they attend church on Christmas. 77% do it to honor Jesus. Uh, 9% to observe the tr- tradition, 9% they do it because they're going with family and friends, 3% uh, to get into the Christmas spirit, and 2% they had no idea why they showed up on that day. They're just kind of walking down the street, I guess, and I didn't walk in that room there, and it's, oh, it's Christmas, hey, thank you, Jesus, right? Uh, now, uh, so, so we've got this unwrapping Christmas production that's going on here. Now, we could take a hold of these, post them out, put them in every letterbox, arrange that, you know, someone deliver it. But the, the problem with this is that only half a percent of what goes out uh, will get visitors. In fact, when we launched this church, we put something like 30, 45,000, 40, it was 45,000 flyers in letterboxes around this region, and uh, we got one family that showed up for four weeks. Uh, so, so, you know, the point is this, is that we get so much mail that shows up most of us throw it in that, file it in that round thing in the kitchen that we call a trash can. Uh, so, so um, you know, that means uh, out of every 5,000 flies, 25 people show up. Uh, we proved it to be different. But uh, uh, let's just have a look at this one la- r- level here of statistics. Uh, interesting. Here's the thing. Statistics on your side. If you invite a family member to church at Christmas time, 67% will come. Whoo! How exciting is that? The statistics are on your side. And if you invite a neighbor or friends, right, uh, 60% will show up at that particular time. My point is this, is that, you know what, you've got more chances at Christmas season to get them in church. You've been praying. You've been believing God for the family members, the ones that you kind of ticked off with. Anyone ever get ticked off with family members, right? Can't be including anyone in this room here. Uh, but, uh, but uh, you know, here's the thing is that they're, you're just like, man, they just need Jesus, Neighbors need Jesus. My friends I study with, work with, they need Jesus. Well, how are you going to get that across to them? Well, it's a great time to get them here. Uh, next week, the North Pole discovers the real meaning of Christmas. It's funny. It's hilarious. It's exciting. And uh, we've got a whole bunch of these flyers that are down the back for you to take with you, hand them to people this week. Uh, let's make that happen. So let's just carry on here. Uh, why do people not evangelize? Number one, ignorance. Number two, fear. Number three, is that they're ashamed. They're ashamed of Jesus. Uh, No one would want to admit to this, but the reality is people have seasons where they're ashamed of who they serve. I'm ashamed to tell you that I was ashamed. When I was a teenager, I kind of was one of those undercover Christians in my 
uh, school that I was part of. I didn't want anyone to know that I was a Christian. And so I would find a Christian and I would mock them uh, and have other people turn on them. I'm ashamed to say that, but I was ashamed. And so therefore I would shame others because I didn't want to get exposed, but I actually made a decision. I had to repent of that stuff. And uh, it's interesting that of a fivefold ministry that uh, I'm strongest as an evangelist than any other one of the fivefold ministry. Uh, but God said, all right, you, uh, I'll put this on your life. And uh, so, so here's the thing is this, is that uh, we've we got to understand that uh, there are people that are ashamed, but uh, Scripture says that I'm not ashamed of the gospel because there's a power of God under salvation. And, and here's the thing is this, I've, I found this that, uh, you know what, there are a lot of people that uh, are not ashamed of their sin. You, they, you come home, uh, sorry, you go to work on Monday, you turn to your work colleague, hey, what did you do uh, this weekend? Man, I went to this party, man. Yeah, man, it was, it was so much alcohol, the drugs, the girls, and man, I got smashed, man. It was a, it was a party. And it's just like, oh, cool. And then they turn to you, what did you do? Oh, not much. I had some family time. So you missed out on your opportunity right there at that moment. Come on, man. It, 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 come on. If they can get passionate about their sin, come on, we need to get passionate about a Jesus that transformed and changed my life. What did you do? Man, I went to church yesterday. Phenomenal band. They had these uh, incredible musicians in the place, incredible creative ability. Man, this guy, he wrote a song, he sung the song. This guy here, we're leasing a song, a, a Christmas song this week. Is that right? In a few days' time, you, you gotta see that, celebrate. Listen, Christmas carol, it's a, it's a Christmas song. I don't know if it's a carol, but it's a, it's a carol. Uh, man, this place, is, I mean, you've gotta get down to the church. Good looking people, they had showers. Uh, they, I mean, it's a great environment, great music, great messages. But come on, you hearing what I'm saying? Like, use the op. let's not be ashamed of it. Let's uh, understand that it is the power of God unto salvation. It's what it's all about. The fourth reason is disobedience. Uh, disobedience. Uh, we know that we're meant to go. Uh, the Bible says, if you love me, uh, you'll do as I command. Uh, so, you know, just, you know, disobedience is sometimes a reason. Well, number five, you just don't care. I can just go to hell as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> I hate them, right? And there are some people, there are people I've spoken to that it's got so much unforgiveness sitting in their hearts where they're just going, you know what? I don't want to tell them this stuff. I don't want them to be exposed to my friends, uh, to this environment that brings transformation. Uh, man, you've got to understand, the Bible's really clear. The, the, the eternity, there's one of two places. There's a heaven and a hell situation here. I don't want anyone to go to hell. I don't want anyone to be away from God for all eternity. I don't want to be in a place where uh, sickness and pain and, I mean, you, you, I don't have time to talk about what hell is like. You, I need to make sure that every individual gets to heaven. We need to plunder hell, populate heaven. That's what it's all about. And I remember a time where I was at university on a bus. I've told this story many times, but on that bus, coming home, 10 o'clock at night, a guy pulls a gun on me, man, I just lifted my hands. I lifted my hands and surrender. I didn't want to get shot. I didn't want to have no bullet go through my b blood. Uh, but here's the thing. I could have looked at the guy and I could have said to him, well, you know what? I don't believe in bullets, so do what you want because I don't believe in bullets. Well, if he pulled the trigger, you know I'd feel the effects of that trigger entering my body, right? The people say, well, I don't believe in Jesus. I don't believe that God exists. Well, whether you believe it or not, you can understand the effects of it when you enter the other side of life. Because when you step on the other side, you're either going to stand or you're going to stand before Jesus and He's going to look at you and He's going to say to you, either well done, good and faithful servant, come and spend eternity from me. Or He'll go, you know what, away from me, wicked servant, and you'll spend eternity in hell in that place. So, so here's the, and, and by the way, I'm being a little bit bold here because it's a reality but, but we are in a season right now, and the season is an opportunity for us to invite family and friends into an environment, into a church that's loving, that's graceful, that, that ha loves to have fun. We love to laugh. We love to enjoy each other. And you say, well, what if I bring them and what, what if they don't give their life to Jesus? Well, if they don't give their life to Jesus, they don't give their life to Jesus. In fact, statistically, they say that the average person has to hear the gospel seven times before 
they give their life to Jesus. I love a show of hands in this place, but did anyone hear the gospel once and gave their life to God straight away? Anyone at all? One person in this room, right? That's typically the situation. You've got to hear it a few times over before uh, they make that ho- uh, possible. But then understand, it's not your job to get them saved. The Apostle Paul said this in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verses 6, and if I could have some music, he said this, I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God made it grow. My job is just to plant the seed. My job is to water the seeds. And today here I am in this room, either dropping seed, I'm watering a seed that's in your life. But it's God that brings the harvest. It's God that makes it grow. So what is it we can do this week and lead up to this production? Number one, let's get a revelation. It's harvest time. Jesus' words were this. He said, the harvest is plentiful. I oh, know, but we live in a really, really hard region. And it's interesting that every church pastor I met, not everyone, but most most regions are really hard. No matter what city you go to, no matter what nation you go to, it's just really hard. They're just stubborn people, rebellious. They're into their money, into their riches, into the idol worship, witchcraft over there. I mean, no matter what pocket of the planet you're in, it's hard. Well, if you've got a mentality it's hard, it's gonna be hard. I get a revelation of the fact that the harvest is plentiful. I believe that we're in the greatest hour of the church. I believe that the harvest is so plentiful. In fact, statistically, I'm I'm using that word a lot today, but there are more people giving their life to Jesus today than any other time in history. And the greatest miracle is not someone being raised from the dead. That's pretty cool. The greatest miracle is not someone getting out of a wheelchair. The greatest miracle is not the blind seeing and the deaf hearing. The greatest miracle is someone giving their life to Jesus. When they go from darkness to light, when they go from eternal damnation to eternal life, it is the greatest miracle. The harvest, we've got to get a revelation. Get a revelation. Your, your friends, your family are closer than you think. And, and it's like every demon that's kind of wrestling them back, that's why they react sometimes. The devil's trying to. Just because they said no doesn't mean it's failure. It just means it's a result, right? Number two, I'd love a show of hands in this place. Who, who in this room at some point in your life said, I would, there's no way I'd ever be found in a church or would ever be a Christian? Anyway, come on, be, come on, be honest in this place. It's like, there's no way. Number two, what we can do is start praying. I want us to be a praying church this week. Let's be praying that the harvest comes into the house of God. Let's be praying for those lost family friends and those those neighbors of ours, right? We're preparing for the invite. When we've done a bit of praying, come on. Let's let's get on social media. This week, we're gonna have a few things on our social pages. We're gonna have it in our chats for you to be able to take that, put that photograph up, share it, get it out there. You can delete it next week if you don't want it on your page. I know some of you, it'll mess up my, look, it'll mess up my page. Just delete it afterwards, right? Here's an opportunity. It's a a preaching machine. It's a witnessing machine. It's a tool that God's using, right? Just put it in your stories. Get it out there, right? Uh, Invite someone. Come on, let me just do this. Close your eyes right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, Father, just drop a, a person's face, a name, someone that we should invite to this production. Boom, there it is. Many of you are getting many. Just that bastard's gone. You can look at me now before you fall asleep. Come on, tell them what's happening. Tell them the new production, the creativity that's gonna be taking place. Be passionate about it, right? Oh, you should come to our production. Yeah. It's going to be really nice. <laughs> you come here and you might give your life to Jesus and you'd be like me. <laughs> no one wants to see that. I, I, I like handing these people say, 
hasn't got one of these yet, insinuating that everyone else has got one and everyone else is showing up, like, you, you'd be crazy not to show up. Be crazy not to be a part. This is gonna be awesome. There's productions all over the place. But you gotta get down to this one, North Pole. Finding out the true meaning of Christmas, right? Jesus came to give life and life in all its fullness. That's what it says in John 10, 10. So come on, let that life come out. Let that passion come out when you're, when you're witnessing, when you're inviting people. Number five, is minimize the ease of get, them getting there, right? Like if they, they, don't, they don't have a car, let me pick you up. So what you have to do to get them down here? Hey, you should come along to this. In fact, I'll come pick you up. Or I'll come by your house. You can follow me down there, right? But just whatever it needs, do, do that. Or, or maybe this, to say, look, what I'll do is I will meet you in the car park, right? And by the way, if you meet people, don't be late, right? The last thing you wanna do, don't ever be that church where you invite someone and they get to church quicker than you. You should always be earlier to welcome your guests so they don't feel like a little bit intimidated around those places. If you're a friendly church, be hearing what I'm saying. But to sum it up, right? Know this, that what is the call of Christmas? The call of Christmas is to adopt what God did by sending Gabriel to testify that, that the, the Messiah, Jesus is coming. The call of Christmas is we now take the baton up Baton, baton, baton. How do you say it here? Baton, let's get that right. Baton. Don't know how you say it in Indonesia, but how would you say baton in Indonesia? <laughs> Bloody Australians, eh? And by the way, that's not a swear word in our part of the world. You've got to say that sometimes. Australians and Kiwis. Father, we bear in your presence. Lord, your word says that the harvest is plentiful, but the labor is a few. So, so, so it's not the fact that we're in a tough region not that you're not into it, God. The fact that the, the laborers aren't willing to put their hands to the plow. This week, Lord God, let us do our part. As a church, Lord God, Father, to invite people, to bring people, to testify. Father, whether they show up here or they show up in some other church, but Father, we get the opportunity to tell them about the loving grace our Godhead, that despite us and our mess, sent Jesus Christ of the world to die for each and every one of us. In the name of Jesus, Lord God, let boldness come upon each and every one of us. Let there be a fresh anointing that comes. Great Holy Ghost. Great Holy Ghost. God, for those people that you dropped into our hearts, Lord God, those family members, those work colleagues, our neighbours, God, we ask that you'd soften their hearts at this time. Something really stubborn. God, you're the softener of hearts. And if you can soften Pharaoh's heart, you can soften my friend's heart. In the name of Jesus. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Come on, let's give Jesus a hand in the place. That's what it's all about. Before we close up, maybe there's something in what I said. Maybe while I was telling you about that heaven and hell stuff, maybe you were just like, I don't know. Like, where, where am I ending up? Can I say this? Good people don't go to heaven. There, there are people out there that have got this idea that if I just do a few good deeds and if I just, you know, have some good values, and if I do all those things good, then I get to heaven. People are gonna be rudely shocked on the other side. The only way you get to heaven is by repenting and making Jesus Christ the Lord, the Savior of your life. 
We do that through a prayer. We do that by confessing something out of our mouth that Jesus Christ is, is the boss. That he's going to be in charge of our life. So we're going to pray a prayer right now. And if you're in this room and you just go, you know what, I, I, I've, I don't think I've ever settled that. Whether it's for your first time or maybe it's second, third time, maybe like Holly, it's been, you know, multiple, multiple, multiple times. Right, you too, eh? Yeah. Old Google Drive. That's the cool thing. I've met people that have said to me, but I I don't know if I can do it because I keep going back to them for the same stuff. It's probably just best I not do it. No, I'm a repeat offender. First to admit it. Mess up. Messed up. I'll continue to mess up. The good news is this is that Jesus comes in with grace. My life is never the same again, and he'll do that in your life. Would you close your eyes one last time? Say these words after me, dear Heavenly Father. I ask that you forgive me of all my sin. Jesus, come into my life. I want to follow you from this point forward. In Jesus' name.